Hey, it's uh, Ham Nation time. We are going to have a little preview on Orlando Hamcation. Yes, we're hoping we can all go this year. We're hoping we can all go anywhere next year. We're also going to take uh, a look at an interesting concept on leveling the field of contesting. And as we record this on Wednesday night, devastating Hurricane Laura, Category 5 Hurricane Laura, expected to be uh, at landfall, uh, currently 150 mile an hour winds as we're recording this, um, is bearing down on the southwest Louisiana, southeast Texas coast. And we'll talk about that too. And we'll remember Hurricane Katrina a little bit on the 15th anniversary coming up of that devastating storm and we'll talk about a special event station commemorating that 15th anniversary that's all coming up right now here on ham nation ham nation is brought to you from last pass studios you're focused on security but are your employees last pass can ensure that they are by making access and authentication seamless whether they're working in the office or remote visit lastpass.com slash twit to learn more podcasts you love from people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of Ham Nation is brought to you by ICOM. For more information, visit icomamerica.com slash ham nation. This is Ham Nation, episode 468 for August 26th, 2020, Orlando Hamcation Preview. Hi, everybody. It's Bob Heil, and I've got my special friend with me, Miss Gracie. It's dog day, you know. This is (laughs) National Dog Day, and Gracie's going to admire it all. (laughs) She just came in from her walk, so she's really, you know, how that goes. But we have a a wonderful show tonight. Uh, We've got the the guys from Hamcation that really take care of of that whole deal. And uh, they're going to tell us about what is going to happen next year because uh, we all got uh, quarantined this year. So here we go. Check check this out, everybody. I got it. Look at this. Talk about a dog day. Look at this. Oh, yeah. wow. <laughs> yeah. Why not? There you go. That's great. <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh, are we spoiled? Um, yeah. We. I guess a dog is, too. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. See you after a while, Gracie. Okay. You guys are saying, get get out of here. I'll do something. Well, I'm going to do quite a bit. We're going to bring you some really good information. And um, Gordo is with me. Gordo, um, you got some serious stuff here, don't you? Yeah. Uh, tonight, uh, we're going to talk about uh, emergency frequencies, Coast Guard, Marine Radio, licenses. But tonight, we're also going to give out some frequencies. So hams may monitor the distress channels. These are public channels. It's not secret frequencies. And uh, uh, monitor in case uh, it gets overloaded. So lots of stuff going on tonight. And our hearts go out to those of you uh, down in the Gulf area stay safe. Bob? Wow. Yeah, I, I talked to Don a while ago, and Don Wilbanks, and he's he's okay, but pretty close, let me tell you. So uh, get out some pencils and paper, because uh, Gordo's got some really important things. And we've got um, a, a neat thing from George tonight. He's got some things going on. But um, we're going to get started here right away with, with the, uh, the Hamcation guys. And uh, I'm going to put him in the spotlight position because, boy, if anything has to be spotlighted, it's going to be that major, major convention that I call Hamcation. So thanks a lot for being here, fellows. We have not one, but we have two Michaels. So I guess we bring them aboard. And there they are, Michael and Michael. Michael Colley, uh, how are you doing? I am doing good tonight, Bob. Thank you for having us on the show. Well, we want to hear more about what's going on down there. And your other friend, Michael. Michael, how are you? You doing good, Mike? Doing very well this evening. And, and uh, okay. I agree with what Michael said. Thank you for having us on the show this evening. 
Yeah, well, we, we like to pass information. That's what it's all about. So I'm just going to get with it, and uh, we're going to talk about what's going on and uh, how you guys are handling the, the hamcation and all that kind of good stuff. And you uh, take over and tell us what we're seeing as I page through these. All right. Um, this is actually before the opening uh, of hamcation on uh, Friday morning. Uh, everybody's lined up to get their tickets. Um for the show um this year will be actually the arl national convention uh wow. for hamcation okay this is inside our commercial vendor area uh some of our vendors set up uh, ready to go uh for the big show Uh, this year, ARL, just like I said, is uh, ARL National Convention. Uh, they will be doing training tracks on Thursday, uh, February 11th, before the show. You can find out more information if you go to ARL.org slash expo on that information. Mm, that's great. And, of course, you can't have a ham fest without some good food going on. Uh, we had a lot of new uh, food vendors uh, this past year, and they were all hits. So uh, we're going to bring a lot of them back uh, for this coming February and lots more. Yeah, they always have good food there. That's great. And, of course, you can't go to HamFest without winning some prizes. So this was actually our prize and in info area. Everybody going in to drop their tickets in the prize booth. Excellent. And uh, we're fortunate enough at Hamcation to be able to actually hold over 200 RVs on site. So if you have an RV, please uh, bring it to Hamcation. And uh, all the sites have electric and water hookups. And we do have a large indoor swap area with over uh, 200 tables inside. Wow, I know that's it. That's an important thing. That's great. And uh, also outside, we have a large tailgate area, uh, the area that most people like to go to find those uh, lost treasures or uh, some people call them boat anchors, but um, <laughs> everybody <laughs> likes them. Wait a minute. You're talking about stuff like that, right? <laughs> oh, Wow. <laughs> But that all works, and I use it every day, so I can't, I can't throw it away yet. But that's okay. Yeah. But you, oh, I know you, you good have deals a wonderful, out there on that type of stuff. Yeah, you have a wonderful swap and uh, tailgate area. That's great. Um, this one's actually our Carol Perry Award, and I'll let uh, Mike actually take over for this one since he's the awards chairman. All right. Thank you, Michael. Um, in this photograph on the right, we've got the honoree of the award, Carol Perry. Uh, she was the initial award winner uh, three years ago for the Carol Perry Educator of the Year Award. And then on the uh, right-hand side is Melissa Poor. She was last year's recipient for the award. Uh, she also is a teacher, uh, a pretty accomplished uh, lady there. Uh, not only has she been real active with... Uh, teaching youth about uh, radio, promoting radio and uh, STEM, STEM activities, but uh, she is also the liaison for ARIS. Um, so uh, pretty, pretty neat individual there. And, Great um, picture. Down at Hamcation last year and presented this award to her. And, uh, sounds like she's anxious to get back to Hamcation again this year. And we lost a little bit of your audio there, but uh, that'll be really good to uh, to see Carol again. She's so, so important to all of us, let me tell you. Uh, here at the end, guys, I, I, I want to do my own thing. I got to show you this picture. This is of my friend Gene, W4IQN. He does all the drawings uh, for the uh, the the entire pine board as well as everything else for me. He's an incredible uh, graphic artist. And he uh, he did this whole project, and it was really one of the reasons that uh, the pine board made it on the cover because of the drawings. They were so good. And uh, another thing that you guys should know that that a lot of people don't realize when you go to a ham fest, there's a lot of things about the radios and all the companies, but meeting friends. There's a typical example. We've been friends for a long time, but we never did meet. 
so we made it a point we could meet at Hamcation. So uh, <laughs> that that's really good. Well, it sounds like you got things already. Anything special, Michael, that's coming up that uh, you haven't done in the past years? Um. Yeah, this uh, year we have a thing called COVID. <laughs> so it's going to be a little different. Um, just playing everything by ear for February to see uh, exactly what uh, type of restrictions we'll have. And we'll let everybody know uh, in the future of what's going to happen. Uh, but this year is also our 75th anniversary uh, of Hamcation. So uh, there's a lot of stuff in the works, uh, plans coming up. Um, that I'll be announcing uh, later on, but our show is February 12th, 13th, and 14th of 2020. Um, yep, front page of the website. The website is what? Uh, 2021. Yeah, 2021. The website <laughs> is uh, live. You can go on here. You can buy your tickets already. You can buy commercial space, swap tables, tailgate spaces, RV nights. Everything's live on here. And if you uh, scroll down to the very bottom of the page, there's actually a spot down there you can sign up for our Hamcation newsletter. Um, if you put your email address in there, subscribe to it. Uh, you'll stay up to date with all the information about Hamcation and um, what's going on, what we're looking forward to uh, for Hamcation. We also have some excellent forums, uh, over 30 of them we do over two days. Uh, at Hamcation. So, um, I enjoyed the uh, space that you had for the uh, workshops. They were in those, uh, I guess they were some kind of a, an army tent. I don't know exactly what they were, but they sure were neat and uh, they had good audio systems in them. That's always helpful. So, thanks for making that happen, Michael. Yeah, and air conditioned as well, huh? Yeah, we brought those in uh, two years ago. They're the clear span tents, which is basically like a portable building. Uh, but we uh, AC them because, you know, in Florida, you never know how the weather is going to be. So it could be hot or cold uh, in February. Well, it sure worked well for me. So congratulations on that. Mike, do you have anything special on awards that uh, that's coming up for this show? Well, the like to remind everyone right now with the website being live, we are accepting nominations for the Carol Perry Educator of the Year Award at this time. So uh, any individual that is promotes uh, radio uh, educating uh, youth, it does not necessarily, the individual does not have to be a teacher. Um, if they're involved, say in scouts and there have been a uh, radio merit badge counselor um, or in their radio club and they've been uh, holding workshops, trying to get youth involved in promoting uh, amateur radio. Uh, these are all individuals that are excellent candidates for the um, Carol Perry Educator of the Year Award. And we'll oh. keep the nominations open until uh, November 1st. And then we'll work, uh, turn, take a look at all the uh, nominations and go through the uh, challenging process of selecting the, uh, the award winner for uh, 2021. So. Okay. Well, it yeah. sounds like you got things rolling, and uh, we uh, ought to have you back a couple of times before if there's anything new. And uh, just you know where I am, just uh, buzz us and Gordo and I will uh, make a space no matter where we are in the program. So let us know so Hope we can come back. Yeah, very good. So we appreciate Thank that. You. Anything else Thank that we need to know? Receiving the award the first year it was uh, it was issued. And uh, the neat thing there was she did not know she was going to be the recipient of that award when that was given to her. That uh, caught her totally off guard. Which, when Carol, that's probably a little more of a challenge to, to get done to catch her off guard. Yeah, yes, exactly. it is. <laughs> well, uh, anything else, Michael, that we need to know? Or did we kind of get it all covered for right now? I think we did for right now. Just uh, everyone go to the website, buy your tickets, um, and we're looking forward to having a great show in uh, 2021. Let's just and hope that your nominations. Those, yeah, get that vaccine going so we can nominate people, buy tickets, buy tables, and all of that good stuff. Well, you guys are my faves, and I, I really appreciate you coming on, Michael and Mike. And uh, you stay in touch with me so we can hear more about 
the wonderful Orlando Hamcation. You can go down and take a vacation, go to Disneyland or whatever, send the kids over there, and you can have a couple of days all by yourself. That's what's cool about it, especially if you live up, you know, kind of in the cold country. Mm, how smart is that? <laughs> so, thanks a lot, guys. We'll uh, look forward to more information about the Hamcation. Sounds good, Bob. Thanks Thank very you. Much and, for uh, okay. Thank you. Good deal. All right. Uh, there we go, Gordo. We can put that on your list and hope that we can get back to doing conventions again. That uh, that'll be my whole thing. But uh, you already live where it's warm, but. It'll be fun to get together in good old Orlando. It's always a great place, isn't it? Oh, it's a great place. 200 uh, spots for RVs. They normally have about 70. So for those of you with a big mama RV or just a small convan like we have, plenty of room and electricity and water. So uh, bring your RV and then you don't have to worry about parking once you park. That's right. That's right. Well, Gordo, I want to hear about all these three. I know you got some really important things, so uh, take it away and let, let's get our pencils happening because we're going to have to. Okay. Well, that. first of all, a big congratulations. Uh, if you've read the latest issue of QST, Steve Ford, who was the editor-in-chief, is uh, going on a uh, long vacation from uh, both QST as well as the league, but he says not on AM radio. Becky, who has been the editor, now is promoted to editor-in-chief, and she is great in editing pieces. So if you've ever thought about writing for QST, get a hold of Becky, and uh, she'll uh, review your article, and uh, we may see you in upcoming issues. Steve Ford, Great job for the many, many years you've been with the league. Well, as you know, the big hurricane is uh, moving in tonight, Category 4, maybe going to 5, Texas, Louisiana, and who knows which way it'll go from there. But I have some frequencies that you may want to monitor. <clears throat> One is just above the 75-meter band, and it's the United States Coast Guard. This is a published distress channel, single sideband, but remember, on marine radio, you see the icon back there, the marine radio, all long-range single sideband frequencies are upper sideband. So 4125 kilohertz, upper sideband for nighttime use. And during the day, tomorrow, 8291 kilohertz. And there's no telling what kind of calls you're going to hear. We've recorded many. I work with the Coast Guard Auxiliary, and we know that auxiliarists both in the Texas, Louisiana area are all on active uh, monitoring, and so are we along the West Coast. For those of you close to where the hurricane's going to hit next to the ocean, Marine Channel 16, the Distress Channel 156.8, and you'll hear plenty of traffic there. And, of course, the... Uh, uh, the uh, National Weather uh, Service Hurricane Center out of Miami, 14 decimal 325 days, about 7,200 up or down in the evenings. Well, let's take a look and see what's behind some of these communications and what licenses you may need to take part in uh, working on radio gear or uh, just uh, having another license to put on the wall. This license uh, used to be a popular one among radio and TV engineers like George because it took the first class FCC license to be able to work on the insides of uh, and even adjust the outside tuning of radio and TV stations. Um, the first class license lasted until 1984, along with the second class that was for working on technically land mobile as well as marine radios, including Coast Guard radios. The third class was mainly an operating license. Well, they've all been rolled as of 1984 into the general radio operator license. Oh, I know, Barmer, I used to have the first and now I'm just like, 
like a second class or no, no, we can tell who had the first. Look at the bottom right hand side, PG hyphen one one. That one one stands for the first class license. It was a five year license and now it is a lifetime. And that license is necessary to do a whole bunch of different things. <clears throat> um, if you plan just to operate a marine radio aboard a vessel carrying more than six passengers for hire, you're going to need the marine radio operator permit. That is element one. And that element one is um, 144 questions to study. 18 out of 24 gets you through there. For working on equipment on the inside, uh, that is going to be the PG, and that takes elements one and three. Element three is 600 questions, 75 out of a test of 100 gets you through the test. And to be a GMDSS, that's the big major ships and cruise line operators, uh, you've got to study 600 questions, get at least 75 correct on a 100 test question exam. Radar, if you plan to work on uh, the radar, the radar is element eight, and that's uh, passing 38 out of 50 total questions, 300 in the pool. And then if you want the very highest, highest, that's the GMDSS maintainer. Boy, you got to be technical for this one. <clears throat> that is uh, a total of 250 questions get 38 out of 50. Well, these uh, questions used to be secret until 1984, and then the Federal Communications Commission had great success with the amateur radio service, turning it over to commercial operator license exam managers. So they worked up uh, different uh, question pools, and we're about the only one that published both the question pool through the W5YI.org, but also give you explanations of the correct answer, not just a Q&A. You can get a Q&A for free right on the FCC website, but it's a real hassle because they don't tell you the correct answer unless you go to the bottom and they don't give you any explanations. Huh, the book uh, tells all. Well, here's the big tell all. Those of you with an extra class license, even an old extra class license prior to April of 2000 that required the code, the extra class license test questions, many of them are found on the commercial general radio operator license exam. Um, more than a quarter of them are word for word. And you can see the extra class uh, question on the left from my extra book. And then on the right, almost, I no, it is identical. Even the same A, B, C, D order uh, on uh, the right-hand side. So if you've recently passed or are currently studying for the extra class ticket, uh, pass the extra test and then start studying for your general radio operator license because that gives you plenty of opportunities to play radio. <laughs> also, plenty of opportunities to go for a little cruise around the harbor for your radio checkout because remember, those small passenger vessels, this one is one of the the larger one that goes to Catalina, they require a minimum of a marine radio operator permit to be aboard every cruise that MROP license holder just needs to pass element one. <clears throat> Easy. You can do that in about a week's time and you are on the air and you get a nice sea ride back and forth every time the ship goes out with paying passengers. But the big deal is for those of you extras that go for element three, the G-R-O-L license, that license allows you to conduct every five-year equipment tests aboard these small passenger vessels. Not the big cruise ships, but these small passenger vessels, including ferries, fish boats, in this case, an excursion catamaran. Now, your radio test is not going to be one where you pull the equipment and take it into uh, the shop to uh, work it over on all your test equipment, but to actually bring your portable test equipment to the bridge of the ship 
And you spend about two and a half hours uh, on the clock uh, working over the VHF marine radio, the single sideband radio, uh, looking at the EPIRB, looking at the radio's connection to the GPS all of this is your responsibility to sign them off, whether it's a big Catalina flyer like we saw, or maybe just a small pontoon vessel like this that indeed goes more than um, a few hundred yards offshore. They, too, are required to have as a minimum one person aboard with a marine radio operator's permit easy to get that ticket. And every five years, someone to come down and get them signed off for the required U.S. Coast Guard radio telephone equipment test. Now, you're not going to be bringing stuff like that down to the boat. Be nice, but nope, nope. What's in your backpack is much smaller stuff, a frequency counter, voltmeter, dummy load, uh, VSWR meter, a deviation meter. Uh, the deep meters are relatively big and expensive, but I found that with slight, very slight modification of the MFJ deviation meter, it works just as well as a, a several thousand dollar one. And of course, uh, at the very uh, bottom, a bird uh, watt meter and your 50 point checklist. That's the type of gear that you're going to be bringing on board. One of the things that we have to check for is that behind a counter or behind a shelf is an installed SWR meter so that the skipper can always tell that they're putting out power. Shakespeare makes a little meter like this that's very good. But again, for our testing, we've got to use a bird and really get down to the milliwatt uh, level. There's the deviation meter. And again, uh, it's modified and modifiable uh, so that it works instead of 146 up at 156, <clears throat> the middle of the marine VHF band. And you're also going to be down below undoing connections, taking uh, things apart. So you want to be sure that you don't leave them with stuff hanging. So a good selection of wire ties, some black tape, diagonals. And again, there's that bird watt meter. Uh, that really shows who's the pro when you're coming down with that type of gear. <clears throat> One of our tests to sign off the small passenger vessels is a uh, test of the uh, battery system. <clears throat> and um, many times we can test some of them right here. But uh, the need for you to actually go down there and physically look at the batteries. On some vessels, <clears throat> no problem. Lift the hatch. There they are. I like to make sure I don't see any fuzz and buzz uh, around them. Make sure it's in a ventilated area. Uh, I can put a load on them by uh, having them crank over the engine if their engines are starting off of the radio telephone batteries, which in many cases is permitted. On some of the other vessels, uh, the larger ones, uh, going over the small passenger vessel inspection list. And by the way, that is available from the Federal Communications Commission. They actually give you a list thanks to the RTCM <coughs> Radio Technical Commission for Maritime Services that helps add to that list important points. And the latest important point is we need to check for number one, do light emitting diodes real close to uh, the VHF antenna, uh, do they interfere with the reception of VHF? Uh, and that we test for by tuning in a weak weather station. And another one is, uh, does the marine VHF have a public address function? And when they go to the PA function, what happens to their required channel 16 distress channel watch? Well, I can tell you when they go to PA on their VHF marine radio, it blanks out channel 16. They're not going to hear anything but the sound of a foghorn ahead. So it's something we look for and we caution them that uh, they need to have a separate PA system. 
very critical, especially uh, tonight and tomorrow. The United States Coast Guard uh, carries a watch on digital selective calling frequencies. On single sideband, there are one, two, three, four, five, six of them, one for each major marine band. And these are digital channels. But on marine VHF, the digital connection comes from either the radio's own built-in GPS or a connection to the shipboard GPS system going to the VHF radio. Because most important, that distress button, when activated, <clears throat> wants to see latitude and longitude to send out the digital Mayday call. So you've got to make sure that when you're checking out these radios, <clears throat> and again, you're on the clock for two to three hours, uh, most folks charge about $100 an hour, and they work for a company. You could do it on your own, but you got to watch out for liability and insurance issues. I like the idea of working with a marine electronics company that will send me out and also back me up. Anyway, you want to make sure that the GPS is indeed working, and uh, that means every time you go down there, you got to sort of learn a new radio. Uh, this fellow was saying he was not getting uh, any responses, and we found out that his TX power was in the fail mode, and uh, it wasn't until we uh, found out why, and that was uh, a, a PA transistor. One of the legs uh, came off when the radio went flying in heavy seas. So these are all things that we check out, and you got to get to the back of the radio. Oh, that's no problem. Oh, yeah. Tell me aboard a boat. You got to get down there, hands and knees, <clears throat> wiggle inside there to get at the PL259, uh, unscrew the coax, put your uh, bird watt meter uh, in series. And oh, no, now I've got to key the mic and I got to get on the right. You get the idea. It's sometimes uh, uh, a real hassle. <clears throat> So you got to be ready to roll. Uh, the biggies, uh, some of these very large ships, all of their batteries are down below. And that means you've got to go down there and uh, skin your elbows or knuckles and get over to the batteries to perform your battery inspection. So it's a physical job as well as checking things out. Flight service stations are always looking for GROL operators who have passed elements one and three. And uh, they're looking for folks that will work alongside the aeronautical technician and sign off different aspects of the equipment aboard. And this includes the equipment aboard, even police helicopters. So if you work with a municipality that has aircraft or police helicopters or uh, police boats or fire Fire boats, they're always looking for that uh, uh, five-year inspection, and they're also looking for someone that's going to make sure that uh, everything is properly signed off with a GROL license. So that means you've got to be, again, down on the back and checking things out and wiggling around, checking out the installations of both shipboard radio as well as aeronautical radio because the rules are clear. Uh, these installations uh, have to be signed off by the GROL operator uh, who has the license to sign off both commercial small passenger vessels, as well as aeronautical stations. Look at that neat wiring. Good job. And things you're looking for is, remember, ships and aircraft uh, sometimes have uh, intense vibrations, especially the helicopters. So you got to make darn sure that all of the connections have not wiggled loose. Just one of your things. And you always got to be looking around going, <clears throat> hmm, What's going on here? Intermittent VHF radio? <laughs> well, what happened there? Of course, seawater got into the jacket, got into the braid, and the braid through capillary action will uh, really cause problems. <clears throat> so there's Jason Gann, W6AUX, United States Coast Guard Auxiliarist. You do not have to be with a Coast Guard Auxiliary for these inspections. You can do it all on your own by studying and passing elements one and three, uh, he's always busy in both East Coast and now he's uh, West Coast and now he's on the East Coast doing the ship 
radio telephone inspections for small passenger vessels. This looks like either a fishing uh, vessel that takes parties out 12 to 15 miles. <clears throat> Again, they have to have the Element 1 Marine Radio Operator Permit Holder on board for the cruise and Element 1 and 3 <clears throat> for having the equipment properly installed. And it's that element one and three that allows folks like Jason, an extra class ham, to be able to go aboard those vessels and sign them off for another five-year U.S. Coast Guard um, uh, uh, inspection certificate. There are higher licenses called the Global Marine Distress Safety System. Uh, these are generally much uh, more intense tests. But the, the licenses that you really want to go after would be, if you enjoy going for boat rides, uh, get the Element 1 out of the book. If you enjoy working on radio equipment as well as going for boat rides and aircraft rides, then get Elements 1 and 3. And if you're a past uh, Navy uh, repair, person uh, get certainly the element uh, eight and that is the radar endorsement so if you have to <clears throat> sign off a radar you'll be ready to do that now one more item and then we'll get back to the real world of what's happening with dawn down there in hurricane land um, extra class licensees who were licensed prior to 2000 have the capability to become a commercial volunteer examiner because when you study the book and you're ready to take the test, you don't test in front of the FCC, but rather a commercial operator license exam manager. <clears throat> so if you have the extra and it's an old time extra, you could very well qualify to be part of an examination team to test for the commercial exams, just like you probably do now with volunteer examiner exams for ham radio operators. For those of you that already have your G-R-O-L, good work, but did you know that uh, extra class hams holding the G-R-O-L can now also administer the commercial exams elements one and three. And the largest crossover between ham and commercial is the W5YI group in Texas. Uh, they test for both. They have off an office that has both divisions in it, the commercial licensing manager as well as the ham radio licensing manager and uh, they are looking for more examiners so if you're interested in giving tests you may want to contact the w5yi.org website or call them on the phone at 800-669-9594 tell them what you got Tell them what you want to do, and they'll get you squared away. And it's also at W5YI that you can get this great Gordo book that will get you through elements one, three, and eight. And remember, I come with a book. Well, let's check out and see how Don is doing when it comes to maritime and the water probably getting up to a near uh, uh, knee level. Don, how you doing down there, and what's your weather? Oh, we're fine over here, Gordon. Thanks a lot. Uh, we're 250 miles away from landfall, so it's just it, we've barely had any rain. All we've had is humidity and a few clouds, so it's not going to be any issue at all. We're looking at maybe a half inch of rain, whereas, you know, they're at landfall. They're looking at feet of rain. So it's uh, here wow. in Mississippi. Remember, it's going in around Texas. We live in Mississippi, so there's 250 miles of Louisiana between us and and it. So we're in good shape on this one. Yeah. But you know, it was 15 years ago on the 29th that Hurricane Katrina came through. And this one is being compared a lot to Katrina. This is going to be a huge monster storm for Lake Charles, Beaumont, possibly Houston, um, all of the, the southwestern Louisiana. And it's going to remain a hurricane probably all the way up towards Shreveport. So it's not just, you know, once they hit the ground, once they hit the, the coast, oh, it's over with, it's on land. No, something this big, this is a monster. We're talking about 145, possibly 150 mile an hour winds. You're looking at, uh, it may be a category five before it actually makes landfall. It's a four now, or the last time I saw it was a four at 145. So uh, this, is, this is devastating. This is um, unsurvivable 
is what the National Weather Service has said. Um, if you're in the path of this storm, you need to get out. So, uh, yeah, our uh, our thoughts and prayers are for those uh, over in southwest Louisiana, southeast Texas, along the coast. They're having to deal with devastating Hurricane Laura tonight. Going to make landfall around 2 a.m., between 1 and 2 a.m., middle of the freaking night. That's the worst time for uh, any kind of severe weather, let alone a landfalling major hurricane or tornadoes or anything else, because you can't see them coming. Uh, it's so, yeah, it's just, it's, uh, going to be very scary. And coming up this weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, myself and, uh, several other operators will be holding a special event, uh, station commemorating the 15 year anniversary of hurricanes, Katrina and Rita. And, uh, to find out more information about that, just go to uh, qrz.com and look up K5R, Kilo 5 Romeo or Katrina 5 Rita. And uh, beginning at 6 p.m. Central on Friday night, we'll be on the air all the way through Sunday. Uh, be spotting ourselves uh, on the various uh, spotting uh, sites and everything else. So be listening for K5R and uh, we'll be on uh, remembering. Certainly changed my life. Let's go ahead and get into the news of the week from Amateur Radio Newsline. Then we're going to come back and tell you about a really neat take on leveling the playing field as far as ham radio contesting goes. But first, here's Newsline. From Amateur Radio Newsline Report, number 2,234, these are the Ham Nation headlines for Wednesday, August 26th, 2020. Encouraging news for hams who prefer to use the digital modes. Band plan talks have begun on an international level. Now that's teamwork. The three regions of the International Amateur Radio Union are collaborating on HF band plans that are designed to accommodate the exponential growth in HAM's use of the digital modes, most especially FT8. This effort closely follows a recent move by the ARRL, which has asked the Federal Communications Commission to allocate a portion of the HF bands specifically for digital use. The three IARU regions have established a band planning committee with representatives representation from each region, which is working to establish allocations that are aligned with one another around the world. There will be a review of the different digital modes using HF, and members will study how these modes can share the limited space in the spectrum. IARU Secretary Dave Sumner, K1ZZ, noted that the cooperation of the three regions in a dedicated effort to coordinate band planning is unprecedented in the history of the organization. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Andy Morrison, K9AWM. The Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico is trying to solve the mystery behind the accident that knocked the reflector dish off the air this month. More than a week after a structural cable snapped and damaged a reflector dish at the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico, halting all observations, the mystery remains as to how it happened. The Space Research Facility's work concentrates most prominently on deep space, planetary exploration, asteroid characterization, and gravitational waves. It is also the home to the Arecibo Observatory Radio Club, KP4AO. According to several press accounts, the broken cable created a 100-foot-long hole in the giant reflector dish, shutting the National Science Foundation facility and halting all operations at the observatory, which is managed by the University of Central Florida. Shortly after the cable broke on the 10th of August, the UCF said that it would take about two weeks before the observation activity could return. A spokeswoman for Francisco Cordova, the observatory's director, told Newsline that the team assigned to assess the cause was still studying the damage. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Kevin Trotman, N5PRE. In New Zealand, Summer Field Day is expected to be a big deal for young hams in February. When is it actually considered fun to get on the air? When band conditions aren't quite the best? When it's part of a youngster's on-the-air exercise? In New Zealand, Yota Oceania is busy preparing for the Jock White Memorial Field Day event to be held in Wellington at the Kaitoki Camping Ground early next year. Organiser Benjamin Isaacs at L2BCI said that the HF contest is named to honour the former NZART contest and awards manager who is now a silent key. 
The challenge facing the young hams, who'll be participating on the 27th and 28th of February, will be to work as many other ZL stations as possible and to listen for any potential contacts into Australia, even if conditions are poor. The call sign details are still being finalised, but you can be sure you'll be listening for the last four letters, which, of course, will be Y-O-T-A. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Jim Meachin, ZL2BHF. And that's all from the Amateur Radio Newsline, your independent source for amateur radio news for four decades and counting at arnewsline.org. With Andy Morrison, K9AWM, Kevin Trotman, N5PRE, Jim Meachin, ZL2BHF, Karen Eve Murray, KD2GUT at the news desk in New York, and our news team across the globe. I'm Don Wellbanks, AE5DW73. We'll see you next time here on Ham Nation. All right, good stuff from the Newsline crew. We don't have a solar update from Dr. T this week, but of course you can always follow her on Twitter and uh, check out spaceweatherwoman.com and also uh, look up Tamitha Scove on YouTube to get the absolute latest. Let's uh, switch gears and go up to, uh, well, he's actually one of George's neighbors up there in, uh, uh, around the Jackson area. That's Frank Howell, uh, K4FMH. Uh, and uh, good to see you, my friend. It's, uh, let's see, what was it? The, the last ham fest we both went to, uh, that was uh, down here in, in Mississippi somewhere. Where was that we saw each other? I think that was over in Louisiana. Was it? Yeah. I know it was, yeah, that, it was, before, that, that the, was wherever, before the world uh, ended. The uh, MTC has their little, yeah. th- they come over for that one. We, we talked there, I think. Good to see yeah, you then and good to see you tonight. Well, good. It's, it's good to be seen, especially on a night like tonight um, with, with all the uh, tropical weather and everything going on. But this is, uh, this is fascinating. Um, it's an interesting tape. You're, you're calling it the Portable Operations Challenge. And what you're aiming to do, I think, is to basically level the playing field between mega stations and everyday operators or QRP guys. Uh, tell us a little bit about what's going on with that, Frank. This is a fascinating idea. Well, th- thanks, Don. Basically, I have a small portable operations team, and we enjoy it. We're not big-time contesters, but we do the QSO parties, and we do some some field day and some things like that. So... When you talk to portable operators, not all of whom are QRP, some of whom I have a 500-watt Ameritron amp in in my portable station, and when I can use it, I I do. So you have a lot of variation, but most portable ops that I'll talk to say, you know, I really enjoy the contest. I enjoy the activations. Our mutual friend, Ed, DD5LP, over in Germany, he's a soda activator. They all say, you know, when we get in these regular contests, the super stations are just going to win. It takes a little bit of air out of our sales. So that's fine. I mean, people can spend the money they want to spend, and there's nothing, nothing wrong with that. But it occurred to me, well, wait a minute. If this is a radio sport, which we kind of claim it is, then – what do other sports do to try to level the playing field? And so from the world of golf, uh, Don, let's say you're a scratch golfer. You, you have a handicap of zero and, and, and I'm <laughs> a bogey dreams. golfer, <laughs> you know, uh, but, but yeah. it's hypothetical. Yeah. It's, it's hypothetical here. Okay. Hypothetical. Yeah. Uh, yeah. and so uh, I'm a bogey golfer. Then the handicap index is based on how you and I play over time. And those scores are recorded. And, the difficulty of the course that we're playing, that's the slope rating of the course by PGA certified uh, course people. So there's a there's a handicap index, and you and I may play, and if I'm a bogey golfer and you're a scratch golfer, then I get one stroke per hole. So you, you can shoot better than me, but no better than one right. stroke per hole, and at the end we're tied. So I got to thinking, okay, what is it that keeps portable stations fundamentally different from – particularly super stages. Like our friend Tim Duffy with K3LR has a dozen rigs going. He has a bank of Perseus SDRs, mining PSK reporter, all going to each station. Has power, has multiple towers and beams. Okay, that's wonderful. We'd love to operate there, but the rank and file ham doesn't. So power is one of them. And it occurred to me, well, how, how could we kind of standardize on power? Well, you could force everybody to use one power. Well, let's let them use the power they want, but let's look at some other contests and see how that works. Victor, if you'll bring up the Stu Perry uh, uh, analysis results. 
Now, what I want you to do, if you can, is zoom in on that top row for just to get that as tight as you can. If you can zoom it all on that top row. What, what that is, is the um, Stu Perry 2019 160 meter results by distance. And that, that top row on the left where you've got the higher spot, there you go, on the, the raw distance, the one on the left are the QRO guys, high power. The one in the middle is the barefoot people, 100 watts. And the one on the right is, is the QRP folks. Gee, what happened on their average distance per contact? The QRO guys tended to be much better. On the right, sure. you've got the same contest, but you've got the most distant contact, the real distant ones. Well, the QRO guys just kind of dominated. Okay, that's not news, right, Don? That's, that's right. a dog biting the postman. That is not news. Sure. But, Victor, let's go to the bottom one. Distance per watt. There's so I took a, there, those distances. There we go. This is what I want to say. Yeah. I took the distance in kilometers and divided it by the power they used. Hello, QRP operators. Look at uh -huh. what happened. So we decided to make, and Victor, you can go to that next scoring metric uh, slide. All right. What we decided to do is make the basic score that you get, Don, you and I work each other. Um, you're using your power. I'm using mine. But what mm -hmm. each of us gets is the kilometers per watt. That's our right. basic score. Those will not be gigantic scores in, you know, in, in some cases. But we go, okay. In some, in, and one of the things that we did differently, I've got a 15-person steering committee, including people like Dr. Scott Wright, editor of National Contesting Journal, Don Field, president of United Kingdom, DX Foundation, and a whole host of others. Really, really good people. I'm going to school on contesting and portable ops. People like Ed, DD5LP, uh, mm -hmm. Thomas Witherspoon, um, the guy who wrote the book on portable contesting for ARRL, Stuart. Now, so we've tried to blend these together. We put out a theory, not many contests. I've found no contest that says, okay, here's a theory of how we want to score, what we think is important. And so the mode of transmission very often to say, hey, we want to give some, some cred to CW ops. So if you do CW, you get a higher multiplier. Well, we looked at it a different way. What's the difficulty for making a contact? depending on the mode that you use. Well, phone is the most difficult. Phone is the most challenging, followed by CW. CW can get through when phone can't. But wow, the Joe Taylor revolution and, and the others that have been out there for a while, Riddy and PSK, they can get through when the human ear can't even hear the signal. Right. And so we give the multipliers, if it's digital contact, you get a multiplier of one or nada. If you're CW, you get a one and a half. Uh, if you're phone, you get a multiplier of two. Advantage goes to the most difficult mode to reach uh, contact. Now, all those transmitters in a super station, I'm not picking on Tim, more power to him. He's got one of the best stations in the world, and his, his contest results demonstrate that. Just um, amazing. Thing. He is a great thing with Contest University. My hat's off to him. But but let's face it, when you've got 12 transmitters going, okay, you're going to get more points than that five-watt guy sitting out in a park somewhere. So, Don, let, let's say you've got two transmitters, you, you and a friend, and I'm out there with one. If we go at it all the whole time, we don't let up. Right. The two transmitters are going to get more. So what we yeah. started off doing is say, you can have as many transmitters as you want. We're going to divide your total score by the number of transmitters so we get a per transmitter production. That's sport, right. not gear. Well, right. our, our steering committee said, look, let's don't go crazy. Let's, let, 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 let's, let's weigh this in a little bit. So we're going to max it out at two transmitters this year. And if you use two, we'll divide that score by the number of transmitters. Now, does that really even them all up? Not exactly. We haven't talked about the gain of antennas. 
the directionality and so forth. So right. we've got what we call a tuning parameter. And that is, depending upon where you are, and 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 or if you're a QTH station, if you're at your home shack or somebody else's shack or a, a, a vacation home or wherever, but you're at a fixed point. If you're a, a fixed point to fixed point, what we call a QTH to QTH, that's the easiest contact. Plus, the bigger stations tend to ignore the smaller stations, and they work the ones they can work the easiest, low-hanging fruit. So a, a, a QTH to QTH is a multiplier of one. If you're a portable, well, how much more oomph should we give them? We started out thinking it would be two, and so if you were a portable to a portable, you get a four. Ed Durant, DD5LP, and I did some simulations, and we really came to the conclusion that's too much credit for the portable station. So if you're a, a, a Q to a P, as, the, as the, the chart shows, or a P to a Q, you get a 1.4 la-la-la big numbers out there. I'll explain that for a second. But if you're a portable to a portable, you get a multiplier of two. And yes, friends, all the mathematicians out there will say, what is the square root of two? It is 1.414213562. That's so the or math pi. works it's, out. That's pi. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's close to that. Now, so close to pi, yeah. that, that, that's our scoring metric. And it's very different. Uh, it will be a challenge because after looking at Stu Perry, now Stu Perry is 160, it's not 20 meters, but we don't yet have good data on that. But this is a challenge to see if the QTH station with the air conditioning, with the bathroom close by, with right. nice chairs, with your favorite snacks all there, and, and all that stuff, can you beat the portable op if we use a golf-like handicap? here and we don't know but will you take the challenge to find out don i'll tell it's you what i did i asked i challenged arl president rick roderick our neighbor over near little rock I said yeah. rick you win as a qth station i'll drive to little rock and buy you a steak dinner at your restaurant of choice he didn't budge i then upped the ante i said look if you or dave norris k5uz the delta division director can win uh -huh. as a qth station i'll come over and buy both of you steak dinner can't do much more than that don <laughs> no exactly well throw in a couple of drinks maybe that'd be about it uh, well and we, it, that that's negotiable that's negotiable uh, yeah well uh, yeah yeah you can't choke i mean you got to have something to wet your whistle that it's an interesting concept now when are you have a date set already, I know, for trying this out because Victor, some of the newsline people, the including including Ed Durant, some of the newsline people are planning on doing this. Is it this weekend coming up? No, it's October 3rd and 4th. October. Yeah. Okay. And uh, it's right before the following weekend where there are four state QSO contests. Now, California has theirs, uh, you know, this weekend, and there are several in Europe. So there is no good date. But, right. But. You know, we've we've uh, that's what we're doing. It's the third and fourth. And what we've done and Ed came up with this uh, amateur radio newsline, have a contest within the contest. And you guys as a group figure out, hey, who gets some award, whatever you choose. Um, right. The other network that I, I play in ICQ, we're having one. Uh, I think it will be a way to kind of encourage people to get involved. I know we'll get portable ops. I hope we get uh -huh. a significant number of traditional contesters who want to play and who want to engage. And let's see if this something new in contesting can can be worth, uh, you know, w worth its weight to put it on. We plan to do it. But uh, the steering committee is excited. And we've got, um, we're going to have three awards uh, at this point. This is tentative. We're trying to finalize that. Whoever wins, we're going to keep score. You, you get the biggest plaque. Uh, if you finish second, you're going to get a plaque and we're going to give one for the highest kilometer per watt, no matter how you finish in the contest. And MFJ is given a Zygu G90 to, uh, the overall winner. And Bob Howell has said, how, how sound will be there with prizes and he'll tell us what he's going to donate. And anybody else that wants to award this, uh, kind of creative endeavor, we'd love to have them come on. Foxmikehotel.com, there's a POC tab at the top. 
hover over it, it'll show y'all a sub tab. We're tweaking some of the um, tweaking some of the rules right now, and um, we'll we'll get some of those finalized. You know, when you put something on new Don, yeah, hams are creative. They they'll come yeah. in. Hey, can, can we do can we do two different call signs and go sixteen hours block to block? Well. Let's talk. Let's think about whether that's good or not. So we're going to be yeah. a little more inclusive this first year, and we're going to figure out the right. wrinkles. And the second year, we may have a you know slightly different rule set. Anyway, right. Glad right. to have this opportunity to share with your audience because uh, we're excited about it. And we hope others will be. This will get the the little five watt QRP guy out in the woods somewhere with an antenna right up there, at least yeah. within shouting distance to some. So we'll see. It sounds like fun. It, it sounds like something that I might be interested in doing. And just uh, I, I don't really have any portable uh, portable ops capability, but I do have this ICOM 7600. And I've got that power knob on there that I can turn that thing all the way to the left and go down to one watt. And uh, that could be some that could be fun. So uh, that, that might be, be a, a really big challenge. That, that could, could be. be look, that's you what can I'm operate, thinking. You can operate patio portable. You got to look yeah. everything outside. Can't be any permanent infrastructure except AC main power. Now you can use AC main power, and we've got okay. some people who are going to go patio portable. They're not going to be in their QTH, and they're going to try that and qualify as a portable station. So that's a possibility. Are there? Is there any advantage for generator power? Uh, no, we, we don't. We don't give any advantage yet. And okay. and you know that we've had a tremendous number of of suggestions, and it's yeah. sort of like drinking from a fire hose. You know, sure. Uh, we're going to try this this year, and and we may do some tweaks next year. The reason I'm asking about the generator is I I uh, with these two hurricanes that came into the Gulf, I said, you know what, I haven't used my my uh, Briggs and Stratton uh, storm responder 5500 watt generator. In about a decade, I might ought to get that thing out and see if it still works. Well, it doesn't, but it's going to after the weekend, after I replace the carburetor and clean out a bunch of gum and stuff on it. So I just I was, I was figuring, you know, since I'm not going to use it for this these two storms here this time, maybe I can use it for that if there's going to be an well, advantage. Well, it, it but, won't uh, count against you, so it, you can do it too. Okay. You can try your generator. Yeah. You know, that ethanol, ethanol gas has done a number on number of generators and other power tubes, so. Don, it's, listen, it's yeah, great it's, to see it's you. Crazy. Th thank you and Bob. Hey, you put me there following Gordo. That's not fair. You're gonna have to give me a hand <laughs> gap. I'm not I'm not as entertaining as Gordo. What a great segment coming into the hurricane. I know, exactly. And those uh those uh, US Coast Guard distress frequencies, I wrote those down. I'm gonna be gonna be monitoring those because uh I tell you it's 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 a scary place to be over there and in uh, East Texas and West Louisiana tonight, going to be very, well, very Don, scary. Don, what I will and, tell uh, you is after working with some hydrologists and with EPA on modeling streams, what the danger for you and me might be is when that thing hooks around north, all yeah. around Memphis, it's going to dump a lot of water into that. And it's yes. going to be about a week or two before yeah. you know, our watersheds uh, may have some problems. We certainly hope it doesn't, but, uh, but yeah. there you go. Thank yeah, you the, for everything uh, the, you're the, doing to let us let everybody know. The the Pearl River and the Habolachita Creek around here, where uh, where I am, is uh, definitely going to swell up. So, Frank, thanks for coming on, and this is Thank an you. interesting concept, and uh, I can't wait to hear how it uh, how it all turns out. We'll have you back on with an after action report after the right. uh, contest, and yeah, I think I might just go QRP here on the uh, home station and see how that works out. That's uh, uh, if I if I get time to work that weekend. Uh, Thank Efficient you, Frank. I appreciate you being on. Efficient yeah. use of power. It's in the amateur code. Use only enough to make the contact. That's friend. Exactly Seven right. three. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. All right. Thank you, my friend. Good to see you on here. Let's uh, get a word from ICOM. Then we'll see what George has got going on here. But first, here's this from ICOM. Get out and be active with ICOM's new IC705 and its optional multifunction backpack. The IC705 is your perfect QRP companion as you have base station features and functionality at the tips of your fingers and a portable package covering HF 6 meters, 2 meters, and 70 centimeters. This compact rig weighs in at 1 kilo, or just over 2 pounds, with RF direct sampling for most of the HF band and IF sampling for frequencies above 25 megahertz. 5-watt battery operation with BP-272 
or 10 watts with a 13.8 volt DC supply. Modes include single sideband, CW, AM, FM, as well as full D-Star functions. A large 4.3 inch color touchscreen and live band scope with waterfall. Integrated GPS with antenna and GPS logger. Micro SD card for data storage. It comes standard with the HM243 speaker microphone. And it supports QRP and QRPP operations. The perfect accessory for the IC705 is the LC192 optional backpack with a special compartment for your IC705 and room for accessories for soda activations or just a day in the park. Visit icomamerica.com slash amateur for more information about this and all the great ICOM radios. And ICOM invites you to enter in the weekly drawing for some great swag prizes like T-shirts and hats at icomamerica.com slash hamnation. While you're there, you can learn how you might win in the monthly grand prize drawing for a new radio. And we've got a winner for August. The ICOM ID 5100A is going to Jim Rossell, KF6GRI. Congratulations, Jim. You're going to like that 5100. For next month, we've got a great radio, too. September's prize will be the ICOM IC2730A Dual Band, Dual Watch, Analog Mobile. Simultaneous VHF, UHF, VHF, VHF, or UHF, UHF receive. It's got a large high-contrast display for easy visibility. Rugged Mill Standard 810. Weather Channel Receive with Weather Alert, optional Bluetooth module, and there's free downloadable programming software as well. So visit icomamerica.com slash hamnation after this and each episode and register to win. Sign up, good luck, and don't forget to follow Icom America Inc. on Facebook and Twitter. And that's not all I have to give away, but we'll talk about the rest of it here In just a few moments, but first I've got a controversial subject we need to address here. Today on Smoke and Solder, we're going to talk about strippers, wire strippers. There are a lot of different styles and models available. You can even use a pocket knife, which I do sometimes. Some of these models look the same, but they're not necessarily made from the same materials and the same quality. I wanted to show you a recent discovery here and the ones that I prefer. This style of wire stripper I originally came across at Radio Shack. I believe it was this pair right here. They're cheap and they work with any gauge of wire. You just adjust how wide you open them. This is an old pair right here. They changed them a little bit over the years. There's a little bit newer style that they had at one point. Uh, There are some with green handles. A variety of different ones available. And that's what I've always used. The ones that have notches for different gauges of wire work fine, but I don't generally use those. I prefer these right here. They're small, compact, and easy to use once you get used to them. The trick is closing them just the right amount to bite through the insulation, but not break into the wire strands themselves. Well, just because some look the same doesn't mean that they are. This is a pair from Harbor Freight that looks pretty similar to the ones we have just seen here. But they're pretty much garbage. I mean, you can strip wire with them if you are persistent, but they really don't do that great a job. The ones that I had bought at Radio Shack in years past work much better. And then I decided to try a pair of these right here from Lowe's, made by Southwire. These are the best ones that I have ever used. The quality of the metal is better. The edge here is very sharp compared to any of the others that I had used. Uh, Of course, there's a little gauge right there that you can set for whichever gauge of wire you want to use. I generally just leave it where it closes all the way, and I've got a good feel now for how far I need to bite into insulation. I can tell when it just touches the strands generally, and that works good for me, and it's quick. 
Sometimes I will bite into a strand of wire and then I'll just have to clip it off and start over. But these have really been great. I can't recommend them highly enough for an inexpensive pair of wire strippers. The Southwire wire strippers from Lowe's. And I just wanted to share that with you. You know, um, cheap tools are not usually a bargain. So be careful when you are you're purchasing your tools there. It really pays to spend a little more and, and get the best quality because they use cheaper metals and cheaper tools. That's um, pretty common. And the tolerances and the slack in them. Just not as good. You know, maybe you can use them once or twice and throw them away. But if you're going to be using a tool for a long time, it, it pays to get a quality tool. So I uh, mentioned we've got something else to give away. Well, how would you like an ICOM IC705? You know, that's that new rig we've been talking about here oh, for several months now. Well, it's going to be in the United States. They're shipping in at the end of September, and we're going to be giving one away uh, to celebrate Amateur Logic's 15th anniversary contest. It's the ICOM uh, IC705. It's all band, all mode, including D-Star, QRP rig. Runs off the same battery that your uh, ICOM ID51A runs off of. So, very compact. It's it's essentially, you know, I've I've actually played with one of these, seen it up close. It's essentially like your IC7300 or um, your IC7610, except much, much smaller. Very compact radio. Great for, well, anytime you want to go out and work uh, summits on the air or maybe parks on the air or you just want to go out. Uh, for uh, a good weekend outing or a hike. Perfect radio. They've got a nice backpack that goes along with it. It's a multifunction backpack. It's got room at the very top of it there for the radio and a lot of extra storage space. You could put antennas or uh, possibly a sandwich or extra batteries, water, whatever you wanted to carry with you. There's enough room in that backpack to do it. Also, you're going to want some antennas, so we're going to be throwing in the MFJ uh, 2289 PKG bigger antenna package. You know, it's two of those uh, long, I believe they're 18-foot-long telescopic antennas, and uh, as well as a adjustable coil there, uh, the mount, and it comes with the tripod and the carry bag as well. Uh, you'll want a power supply for charging your battery or for possibly operating off AC. The portable MFJ4115 power supply would make a good companion there, so we'll throw that in. And, you know, you might want to operate hands-free. Or you, you might be in a noisy location and you need to hear a little bit better what microphone or a headset would be great with this. Well, of course, the Heil BM-17 headset, great portable, lightweight headset from our friends at Heil Sound. And as well, we've got one more thing that, uh, well, I just found out about. Uh, this comes from our friends at Master Publishing, the same people who publish Gordo's books. We've got, well, these are, these are some great ones. You know, I've been using these for years. It's a set of Forrest Mims III's mini notebooks. He's got a lot of different subjects there, science and communication circuit projects, electronic sensor circuits and projects, electronic formula, symbols and circuits. And uh, that's just a few of the volumes there. As well, we're going to throw in Getting Started in Electronics from Forrest Mims. So, great price package here. If you'd like to get in on that, well, all you need to do, go to amateurlogic.tv slash contest. Get the details right there. amateurlogic.tv slash contest and help us celebrate 15 years. Well, Amanda is in the chat room tonight. 
I don't know, Amanda. How do we follow everything that's gone on in the show so far tonight? I have one solution. Maybe he'll join oh. me. Radio. Right here. Right here. It's, it's National Dog Day, and my dog has... Oh, there. That's radio for you. He's uh, camera shy. <laughs> <laughs> Like, there's not a shy person in this household except for our dog. So, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, uh, well, we know that the hurricane is coming, and uh, it's going to be catastrophic for a lot of people. Here in Colorado, we have uh, wildfires. It was out help coordinating, uh, testing out some comms today with a, a new emergency coordinator in our adjoining county. So, we have a small wildfire over there anyhow, but most of the state is burning. No big deal. We're used to it now. Um, but we do expect some monsoons and some cooler weather to help those. So we're a little smoky, all that good stuff. Um, let's see. I had a couple of questions here. Oh, George, I have one thing for you. I made this on Valentine's Day for Jeff, and I thought you would find this extremely funny talking about your strippers. So I'm going to show that to everyone. <laughs> Swanky. Yeah. <laughs> those are those little leathermen that are about like this big. Jeff takes those everywhere. I'll tell you, he'll he'll use them on our Peter sites, anything, everywhere. He has those in his pocket all the time. Not trying to make some sales for that company or anything, but they uh, actually work pretty good. All right. Uh, Gordo's not here, is he? No, he's not. Uh, I think he's gone, yeah. Okay, here, Cricket. So I'm going to ask you this one, George. It was a question for Gordo, but it's about a G5 RV. I think you can handle it. When you put a G5 RV, do you twist the 400-ohm ladder like you used to with a TV twin lead? I don't believe you do. At least uh, when I ran one, I didn't do that, and I don't recall seeing anybody do that before. Uh, what about you, Don? Have you used that antenna? I have. That was my first HF antenna, and I did not twist it, and I've not seen any instructions saying that you should. So, I don't know, try it and see if it makes a difference. Yeah, you know, I've seen some other quirky things about G5 RVs where you need to have the the 50 extra feet of feed line, and you coil it up, and you just kind of lay I it on your roof that. or whatever. I did need that. Did yeah, you do that? I did, I did need that. I, you, you needed a... Specific length of coax, specific length of feed line going to the twin lead. Um, it just it made everything tune up properly. Um, I, I had the same issue on a uh, on an off center fed dipole, um, the Carolina Wyndham that I had. It would uh, got RF back in the shack until I had that specific length of coax, and then it solved that. So something to play with. Do some more do some more research on that. Absolutely, and it. If you ask four hams about their opinions on the G5 RV, you're going to get four different opinions. <laughs> maybe maybe five. Say. Maybe five. Yep, two different experiences. So, um, I know we're 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 running over time here, but this one this is kind of important to me. Don, um, we have so many new viewers and a lot of people that haven't listened to some of our old episodes and things like that. So. If you don't mind sharing, I know this is a hard anniversary coming up for you, but if you don't mind sharing us your experience with Hurricane Katrina and telling okay. us uh, what happened, what went on, and just so, you know, we're feeling a lot of other people's pain that they're about to feel tomorrow, and you, for one, have already been through it. So just tell us what happened. Well, we did the smart thing, and we got the hell out. And that's what you should do, is get the hell out. Uh, I'm looking at the 9 p.m. Uh, update from the National Weather Service on Laura. Hurricane Katrina was a Category 5 briefly in the Gulf. Then it went back down to a 4. It's really, really hard to sustain um, that level of strength. It, it was briefly a 5, then it dropped down to a 4, and it was actually a 3 right at landfall. Right now, 90 miles from the coast... Um, Hurricane Laura is a Category 4 with 150 mile-an-hour winds, and it's expected to be a Cat 5 at 156 by the time it makes landfall in about four hours. So this, is, this storm is worse than Katrina uh, by far. 
there's a lot of low-lying areas around uh, Lake Charles and Beaumont and that part of uh, the southwestern um, Louisiana. But as far as me, I, I, we got out. We spent two weeks up in Little Rock, Arkansas. And uh, where we lived, we were on fairly high ground, but we still had four feet of water in the house. Um, both of my wife's brothers had 14, 15 feet of water in their houses. Um a good friend of mine, uh, W4KEV up in Knoxville, Tennessee now, um, he lived down in South Louisiana near New Orleans where I did. His house was folded like a house of cards. Literally, the walls came down, the roof came down because he lived right by a, uh, right by a canal. There was another house uh, that literally, it was a, it was a the, uh, wrap your head around this, a single family ranch style home on a slab floated two blocks down the road floated two blocks down the road and not nuzzled up next to my wife's cousin's house there was another one that that floated and this is in the same area where kevin lived w4 kev floated and landed right in the middle of the road in the subdivision I mean, you could not have have laser measured and put that more in the middle of the road. I saw some of the freakiest things. I, um, a motorhome leaning up against a, a house like this. Um, cars stacked up like they were Hot Wheels cars. Uh, an airplane in somebody's yard. Um, just craziness. Um, the uh, storm surge went through an RV dealership, and it was just a litter of fiberglass and aluminum all through these pastures, these fields. Um, the only thing left standing in a bank was the vault. Just freaky things, the strangest things that I saw. Um, yeah, and we're coming up on 15 years on the 29th for Katrina, and then Rita was September 24th. Uh, which flooded our house all over again. And it was um, about, it was, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was a month or two before we could even get back in our house to visit the area. Um, but it, it just, if you're in one of these things, just go. Just go. Because there's nothing that you own that is worth saving besides your life. That's the one thing you can't replace is your life and your loved one's lives. So it's going to be a very tough night for, uh, for those people over in Southwest Louisiana and also in Southeastern Texas. They're not going to get quite the brunt of this because the storm, um, rotates counterclockwise. So if you're on the uh, Eastern side of the storm of the eye of land, the land falling eye, um, that's the worst part. And also on these things, don't just, Look at where the eye is coming ashore because we're 250 miles away and we're going to get some wind tonight, probably a little bit. Um, there have been feeder bands going through New Orleans all day from this storm. And it's 200 miles. New Orleans is 200 miles away from where landfall is. Uh, you look at what happened with uh, the one that came through earlier uh, in, the, in the week, Marco, which was just a tropical storm when it made landfall right along the mouth of the river. All of the weather was in Florida. So these things are so freaky and so unpredictable. But this one, I will say the National Weather Service has been right on with their predictions of where this would go almost when it, when it finally got in the Gulf and, and all of those models started, uh, uh, started coming together. But, yeah, just you don't want to be around these things. Um, it, this, this storm is a monster, and this is going to eclipse Katrina. And I'm so glad that it's not coming here. To affect us, um, I always get a little bit of PTSD around the uh, around the uh, the anniversary of Katrina, which will be 15 years. But um, it's it's going to be uh, a little bit of therapy, I think, this weekend, as myself and uh, some of the other operators operate the uh, K5R um, commemorative uh, special event station for the 15th anniversary of Katrina and Rita, because it helps to talk about it. It really does. Um, but uh, anyway, so I, I just wanted to say that my heart goes out to uh, those people who are in the path of this monster and the fact that it's going to be probably a Category 5, the strongest hurricane to hit 
southwest Louisiana in the modern age since they've been keeping records. Um, it's going to devastate it. They, they were saying that 20 and 30 foot storm surge as far inland as 30 miles. So mm. this is just, um, yeah, it's hard to wrap your head around that. And the footage that we're going to see when the sun comes up is going to be heartbreaking. So if you're in that area, hopefully you're not in that area. Um, but if you have friends in that area, check on them. If you have family in that area, check on them, make sure they're okay. And, um, I got to say that the two weeks that we spent in Little Rock, Arkansas for Hurricane Katrina was absolutely amazing. I will forever have a soft spot in my heart for the, uh, the, the people up there. We evacuated with, uh, all of my in-laws. We had four or five hotel rooms altogether. And, uh, my son Tyler was five years old. Um, yeah, maybe not quite five. He would he had just started kindergarten. In fact, he'd gone to kindergarten two days when uh, we had to evacuate. And um, once the uh, once the churches up in Little Rock figured out that we had a toddler, a, you know, a, a kindergarten age kid, they were constantly coming by with donations of food and toys and cash and 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 everything else. Probably the most the most heartwarming thing of the my whole experience being up in Little Rock, Arkansas, in North Little Rock was my wife and I were in Target and Tyler wasn't with us. It was just the two of us. And we were just, I think we were getting like a six pack of Coke or something for Tyler and maybe a small ice chest and, uh, uh, you know, just, uh, just a couple of just menial items. I think, I think our whole bill was maybe 20 or 30 bucks. So, you know, we weren't spending a whole lot of money. And uh, the lady in, in front of us in line heard my wife's South Louisiana accent because we weren't talking about the storm at all. And she turned around and said, I'm sorry, I, I hate to sound like I was eavesdropping, but I noticed your accent. Are you from New Orleans? And my wife said, yeah. She goes, oh, wow, are you guys up here because of the storm? I says, yeah, we're evacuated up here because of the storm. And they're like, is your house okay? I says, we don't know because we haven't heard any news. And we haven't seen any satellite images, um, and we haven't heard anything, so we don't know if we have a house or not. And she goes, "Oh my God, um, the the least I can do is is pay for the things in your cart. Can I do that?" And I'm like, "That's not necessary. It really isn't. It's it's, but how can you say no to that? You can't um, because it's such an insult to say no." So the lady paid for our twenty or thirty bucks of our little few little items in our cart and I will forever hold uh, the people in North Little Rock right here. So there's gonna be a lot of that going on um, <laughs> in the wake of uh, in the wake of Laura. So um, take these people into your homes and into your communities as they evacuate because they're going to be needing some help and pray. I I, I think that too, Don, and I think of some of our other tender hearts just here from Ham Nation uh, during Hurricane Harvey where Val just packed up, went down to yeah. uh, Houston and said, I'm here yeah. to help. And she she became kind of a dispatcher and helped a bunch yeah. of stranded dogs. Sorry, another dog yeah. wants to say hi. This is dog therapy. Yes, because yeah. Don just made us yeah. cry. So, yeah. Um, I, and those I, who went to Puerto Rico as well, you know, I went down there as well in the wake of that, and, that mess. Um, yeah. Andy and Val went down there, um, mostly foreign language. I mean, a lot of people uh, don't speak Spanish uh, when you when you come from the United States to there. And they just took it and went with it. They they grabbed the yeah. problem by, by the horns and went in there and helped some people out. So, and in yeah. fact, Andy just really did a spectacular job and met his wife there too. That helped out that yeah, dam and everything. Right. Um, this some amazing souls in amateur radio for one, and we're always going to be here for you guys. Always, we're always here well, to answer the call. The the bad news always always keys on on you know the the bad apples in society, and there are far more good people on this planet than there are bad people, and that's that's really what we should be paying attention to. Um, but yeah, so there will there will be a lot of a lot of um, heartwarming and heartbreaking stories that come out of this. 
and just keep uh, keep that affected area in your prayers. That's that's uh, if if that's the least you can do, that's a lot still. But give to the Red Cross um, if you can go down there and and help uh, in the uh, in the rebuilding. There were a lot of church groups that that came down to South Louisiana and South Mississippi, a ton of them who came down and and, and helped rebuild. The first people, the first people at our house um, to check on it was Canadian Task Force One. The Canadians got to my house before the local people could. Um, And so, um, yeah, it's it's going to be hard to watch, but uh, there's going to be some amazing um, heartbreak and heartwarming information coming out of this so just uh, strap in because it's going to be a it's going to be a ride i agree and uh, don i'm going to take your advice and um, give it to the rest of the viewers out there if they don't already know don always says don't always watch the weather channel if you want actual real information watch your local try to try to stream on right. the local galveston um i don't the lake charles some lake, things yeah, like that uh, where new orleans new orleans has some great uh weather mm-hmm. cover weather uh, uh forecasters here uh wvue fox 8 fox 8 live.com is one that i would recommend uh wdsu is the nbc affiliate and wwl is the uh cbs affiliate they're all great um, we've got some great forecasters down here. So if you want to see some firsthand, um, things, um, uh, firsthand information, I would suggest New Orleans cause it's going to be the closest big Metro, uh, KHOU in Houston would be another good one to watch as far as, uh, go online and watch that just switch back and forth between New Orleans and Houston. And, uh, you're going to get some really good, uh, on the scene weather information. Agreed. I like I like to follow them on Twitter, so you get a lot yeah. more raw footage, yes. videos, and stuff like that. So, absolutely. All right, I know we got to wrap it up here. I'm just gonna go over these yeah. nets real quick, and they've been running for a bit here. We've got 71.92 for the 40 meter net, 70 or excuse me, 14 t65 for the 20 meter net, D star on 14 Charlie, and DMR on 31.012. I almost forgot that. All right, uh, who's wrapping it up this evening? I think it's me. I'll, I'll give you one more uh, great website. It's Mike's Weather Page. If you just do a Google search for Mike's Weather Page, but it's really easy. The, the, the URL is really easy. You know, they, they, all these squiggly lines you see as far as the path of the storm, those, the, the weather forecasters call those spaghetti models. Mm-hmm. Spaghettimodels.com is the most comprehensive tropical weather page I have ever seen in my life. It is always up to the second. So, I highly recommend SpaghettiModels.com. What? That's it, right there. There it is. Every every product that the National Weather Service gives, it's overwhelming when you first look at it, but every product that the National Weather Service has, whether it's tropical or otherwise, is on SpaghettiModels.com. That's a great resource, so check that out. And of course, like I said, and Amanda suggested, follow the uh, TV stations that are in the affected area or nearby, and you'll get some great uh, um, on the ground, boots on the ground information. Yeah, let's go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, we, uh, we're, we're way, way over, over time, but, uh, some good information here. Uh, George, any final, any final thoughts for us tonight, my friend? Well, um, yeah, just, uh, hope everyone is safe down there in the affected area. You know, it's, uh, always bad. And this one came about so quick. I just hope people were able to prepare and get out of the way in time. And I want to mention uh, Friday night at 8 Central, 0100 UTC, we've got the next Ham College episode. And you should join Professor Thomas and Dean Martin over there at live.amateurlogic.tv. And the IC705 contest we were talking about a little earlier, the link once again on that is amateurlogic.tv slash contest. Get the details on how you can register there. Doesn't cost anything, and someone's going to win it. Don? Yeah, may as well be you. That's for sure. All right, uh, Amanda, thanks for uh, being on. Our, our, thanks to our guests from Orlando and also uh, Frank, uh, K4FMH, and uh, uh, and you, of course, for, for being here with us. And again, um, uh, 
our uh, our thoughts and prayers go out to uh, those who are in the path of Laura tonight. So with that, we'll have, I'm sure, a ton of information on that uh, coming up next week here on Ham Nation. And of course, coming up with uh, Amateur Radio Newsline um, uh, on Friday, the new uh, the new issue of, uh, of Amateur Radio Newsline. So with that, we'll say good night, 7-3, and uh, we'll see you on the radio this weekend with K5R. Uh, 7-3, all good night. Good night. Look forward to uh, working the special event, by the way. Be sure to check out the other shows on the network, like my other show, Hands On Wellness. I love to share different tips and tricks that's going to help you get a better grasp on your personal wellness. Just go to twit.tv slash how and subscribe now.